welcome everybody to another exciting month of Innovation in Motion. Um, I'm Kevin Long from Crowd Compass, and uh, today's topic is mobile marketing madness. Uh, on the panel here, we have some really great experts. I'm excited to uh, introduce and dive in. Um, just before that, a few announcements. Uh, we'd like to, first of all, thank Crowd Compass uh, for hosting the event. And would also um, like to introduce just two other sponsors who have come on to help Innovation in Motion. I don't know if anyone's noticed, we haven't upgraded the beer from PBR, but we did upgrade the food from uh, Old Stale Cheese. So, and <laughs> we, we have two sponsors to thank for that. One is Context Partners, and um, Tyler, you're from Context Partners. Can you just say a word about Context Partners? Tyler's going to grab the mic here. It's yeah. not going to go too loud, but it's going to okay. for live streaming in the oh, video. Um, I'm usually the PowerPoint lady, uh, but actually I work for Context Partners and a strategic consultant there. And we are actually a consulting firm based in Portland, started about two years ago. And actually, I think we sponsored this event tonight because we want to announce that we are looking to grow our team. Um, we work with organizations helping them translate their community engagement with their missions or bottom line goals and, trans, um, and really working with nonprofits, for profits across the board. Um, really interesting work that we're doing and we're uh, looking for folks with kind of product design backgrounds as well as community management backgrounds to um, expand our team by another two or three members this year. So check out our website, www.contextpartners.com. And I have a couple of cards left, so I'm happy to share that at the end, too. Great. Thank you, Tyler. And is there anyone here from the Software Association? Do we have another sponsor as well? Software Association Oregon? Well, we'd like to thank Software Association Oregon for the hummus tonight. And uh, hopefully, if you get one more sponsor next month, we'll upgrade from the PBR. <laughs> <laughs> So if anyone um, would like to sit home next month and um, watch live stream and drink uh, any other kind of beer, you can watch that at livestream.com backslash innovation in motion. And if you are going to Twitter anything out, uh, we're using the hashtag in PDX. Um, so I'd like to just uh, introduce the, the guests by name, and then I'm going to do a quick drawing, and then we're going to dive into the questions. Um, so just starting out here, we have uh, two genes. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce Gene Willis. Uh, Gene, raise your hand. All right, Gene Willis is going to be right to the right of me here. Gene is the uh, group account director at Wyden Kennedy. We're excited to have Gene on the panel. Um, the next Gene over, uh, Gene Airbar. Gene Airbar is the director of mobile solutions from iSight Design. And on the end, last but not least, is George. George, how do you say your last name? George Kurtica. George Kurtica. George Kurtica spent how many years at Nokia? Uh, it's been nine years at Nokia. Nine years at Nokia. He's an incredible alum there, and he's uh, starting to look for his new venture as of a month or so ago. Uh, OK, so icebreaker, really quick. Uh, I'm going to just uh, hand out three things here. Whoever can guess the number, OK? So in 2011, mobile advertising in North America was 304 million and it grew it grew from 304 million to what number start throwing it out i'll tell you up or down advertising grew from 304 million to what in 2011 what 800 down little down little down oh up 700 the chocolate goes to Mike, Mike Willis. Oh, it's not just chocolate. There's other surprises in there. All right, the other mobile question. Here we go. Now that you guys know how this works. Now, this is an incredible one. We're giving out sticky pads. Wow. <laughs> how many times per day does the average smartphone user stare at their phone? More than 100. Down from 180. 145, who said that? Here we go, big winner, come on up, you got the sticky pads. That works out to about, there you go. That works out to about once every six and a half minutes for every hour the average person is awake, so keep staring at your phones. 
All right, the last one, people, then we're going to dive in and get really serious here. Wow. Easter is around the corner. This is a grand prize. How many hours, on average, does it take for the average email to be opened versus how many minutes does it take for the average SMS message to be opened? 30 seconds. Oh, no, and, and the caveat is in New Zealand. How long does it take a New Zealander <laughs> to open an SMS message? Who said four minutes? Spencer, you said four minutes. Come on up. You win. What are they he doesn't want it. Time? He seriously doesn't want it. You can't give these things away. Happy Easter. Thank you. There you go. For your daughters. All right. Four minutes. It takes the average New Zealander four minutes to open an SMS message. I think it takes the average American about five seconds. Okay. All right, people. We're getting really serious now. Class time is starting. We're starting with the panelists. Here we go. So what I like to do is have the panelists just talk a little bit about um, what they, their background and their business, and then we're going to dive into some questions here, and we're going to try and talk about some trends and talk about some really um, tactical things that everybody can take home with today. So Mobile Marketing Madness is going to begin with Mr. Gene Willis uh, from Wyden Kennedy. Hello, everyone. Uh, I feel a little bit like a time life operator with this headset on, but I... Um, was excited about this opportunity to come here uh, because actually I have the time to do it. I'm on my sabbatical from Wyden and Kennedy. I've been with Wyden and Kennedy for eight years and they actually grant you a little bit of time away uh, after that much, after, after that period of, uh, of time with the agency. But um, for those who aren't familiar with Wyden and Kennedy, it's a Portland-based international full-service ad agency and we deal with some uh, pretty sizable clients. Uh, for the last 30 years, we've been working with Nike and uh, a few others, um, and I've had the opportunity to work on some of those others, including Nike, but uh, Starbucks, Google, and currently I'm the group account director on both Coca-Cola and Diet Coke. And I included uh, just one image, or a couple of images here. That's the inside of the agency, um, which is a bit of a, it's reflective of just a bit of the maze and labyrinth that, uh, that is the office and its physical space, but I thought it was also appropriate because it reflects a bit of the mobile space right now <laughs> and how we're trying to navigate it. Um, and then the next slide was just a couple of images I grabbed. One is uh, on the left, it's actually um, a compilation of push pins. It's a, uh, and you, as you can read, it says fail harder, and it's one of those Widenisms that, uh, that Dan Wyden just firmly believes in that. Um, you know, you have to be willing to, to really experiment and fail. And uh, that sort of principle, I think, is really applying itself in the mobile space. And then the other one was actually just a quick screen grab I got um, off of Instagram that uh, someone else had taken a photo of that said, walk in stupid. And again, I think it's awfully applicable to just walk in without the assumption that you know what's going on in mobile. Um, there's, there's too much to learn and too much of an opportunity. So. That's a little bit about me and, and where I come from. Great. Let's jump to the next slide. And that looks like George. All right. So hey, everyone. Um, so my career has kind of taken me about 13 years, always in mobile. Um, I've started working at Motorola uh, back in 99 uh, and uh, quickly went to work for Nokia as they were launching multimedia messaging throughout the world. So I was. Uh, able to live in Finland and Europe and travel to about 40 or 50 different countries, rolling out MMS services around the globe. Um, and interestingly, that was supposed to be like the big thing, you know, the big follow-up to SMS. Well, th when I was doing, uh, working for, uh, at, at a Telefonica office in London, I saw Moby TV running on, uh, it was my first kind of mobile app that I really was blown away by, in live television on your phone. Right? Okay, it was more like a, a PowerPoint projection with a stream, and you know, the talking head was maybe tilting and moving like this. But it was, it was pretty cool, and I applied, and I got the job right away, and I moved to San Francisco because I felt that mobile and mobile apps were, were the, next, you know, the next big thing. So um, I did that, and if, if you go to the, the next slide, you'll see that um, you know, I took the mobile apps and, and mobile application business development. Uh, Tyler. 
uh, the mobile applications. So for the last six years, what I've been doing is, is mobile apps and business development for Nokia. So think evangelism, think strategy. At one point or another, I think I've done a deal with every single one of these companies at Nokia. So, you know, just a few. And what we've helped them do is um, take their content, put it on the mobile device, and make some money off of it. And, and that's kind of really what mobile marketing is all about. I mean, people aren't you know, really paying uh, too much money for, for apps these days. They're working on different business models. Obviously, you've got advertising and app purchase, but you know, you've got to be able to market your mobile application. You've got to be able to market yourself on a mobile device. And um, that's hopefully what we'll scratch under the surface a little bit today. Great, great. Uh, and Gene Airbar. Yes, as the other Gene on the panel, um, Gene Airbar, the Director of Mobile Solutions for iSight Design. iSight is a about 65 person now, full service digital agency, headquartered here in Portland. About a third of our people are also in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, we like to think of ourselves as a digital agency that specializes in serving brands who differentiate on customer experience. So what does that mean? Um, essentially what that means is that you, you look at who who you're really serving when you're building out digital solutions for a brand. And ultimately, ultimately what it comes down to is that at the end of every transaction, there's a customer and they're really in the age of the customer, they're in the lead. So what we've attempted to do is frame all of our services, all of our five practice groups around this idea of helping brands lead and lead in excelling in customer experience and using that to differentiate against their competitors. Uh, where this took a turn for me in my, my personal career. I started out as a freelance web developer. I've been working in web technologies for 15, 16 years now. Uh, ran my own agency for a number of years and came to iSight after becoming a mobile developer because they had a compelling need to develop mobile capabilities. You know, when you're a 15-year-old digital agency and you grow up with the web, your capabilities sort of start with and at the time end with the web, since the web essentially was digital. It could be Flash, it could be games, but it's all essentially web-based. Uh, about four years ago, that really started to pivot and, and shift rapidly. And agencies that knew what they were doing quickly retooled to build and add capabilities for, for building out mobile applications, mobile websites. Um, having, experience, having experience with both, I came to iSight with the idea of building out a practice group dedicated to mobile solutions. Um, the, the real, for me, the real uh, kernel of that is that you, you, can't, you can't look at any one customer experience now in the digital realm as siloed in any one, in any one facet of it. So if you're building out a web experience, um, if you're starting with a web experience, then you're probably, you're probably overlooking quite a bit of touch points and, and quite a few steps along the way. So by elevating this idea of serving mobile users to a level of prominence, what we've said is when we lead with digital strategy, mobile strategy is part and parcel of that. And what solution we end up rolling out is really more a basis of, it's more on the basis of what the individual customer experience for each particular brand is. It may end up being a website, it may end up being a mobile app, it may end up being a hybrid approach. And some of the examples that we show will definitely I think illustrate that. Okay, we're gonna get into some examples uh, tonight from each of the panelists up here. Uh, before that though, uh, Gene, to my right Gene, sent over a, uh, a couple slides that I thought was a good uh, slide to start it out. And uh, Gene, if you wanna talk a little bit about the, the evolution of mobile and kind of where we're sitting here. Well, I think this picture is, it's, it's worth a laugh at least, because uh, if you haven't seen the movie Wall Street, you. Um, can at least see by that image uh, that we've come a long ways. And uh, I think it's pretty remarkable as you look at sort of the progression of the hardware itself. You know, you kind of look at the 80s being sort of that, that brick era. Um, and, you know, that device was, you know, nearly three pounds. And, you know, you said how long it is. Yeah, it's yeah 10 inches, <laughs> but that's without the antenna. Uh, 10 inches tall without the antenna. Wow. And, uh, you know, I think that it's testament to the fact that um, <clears throat> this, that things are moving pretty quickly. When you look at what happened by the 90s, it had already been transformed into, of course, its pocket size uh, form that made it far more uh, affordable, portable, 
uh, and yet it was still used primarily for voice, of course. And then you moved from sort of the brick to the candy bar to um, real uh, feature-based phones. So, of course, when you know the uh, implementation of, of cameras and Nokia was a big purveyor of of, of that, um, and being able to to add other features uh, in, and really infuse the data into what had previously been a, effectively just a mobile phone um, really was the game changer. I think that was where um, mobile started to, to really um, evolve pretty dramatically. Um, and then, of course, where we are now in moving past features into really this, this touch phase and the smartphone uh, era, it's a, it's a far more intimate and dynamic experience. Uh, but one that I don't think anyone can question, you know, the uh, just prominence. Uh, I think it's, there's some stat about 70% of the world's population now um, has a mobile device. I mean, you think about that, that's, um, that's teeing us up for some really exciting things. So well, you, you talked about, an, you had another slide. Tyler, can you do the next slide? Gene, put your mic on a little bit. Okay. A little bit. Hear that? There you go. You, you had another slide here about how it actually has evolved. Like, how are you seeing the, the difference here? Which I thought was interesting because each of the panelists sent some examples of some companies that they've worked with and things they've done, and it all seemed to fit into this. Yeah, I think this was, for, for, uh, for me and, and kind of what my discipline is in an ad agency and the clients we work with, this, is, this seems to be a common theme across um, all of our clients and what they're experiencing is there was this linear sort of progression by which uh, consumers were uh, making purchases and there was this broad awareness and then there was a consideration and then there was the sale and that's transformed uh, and now it's not that it's gone but what's happening is there's this en entire uh, peripheral of activity that's happening and actually it's a it's almost a swell and a push up from the bottom where <laughs> And, and, I, and, and mobile deserves the greatest credit for, for this uh, change, where now there is a degree of uh, awareness that is being fu fueled, but it's being fueled by other consumers. Uh, it's being uh, fueled by communities um, and networks, and it's really influencing, um, influencing the sort of sequence of consideration but also the degree of, of loyalty that people have to brands um, and the consideration set is, is really shifting. There's some examples of that, but the, the crossroads of that then ultimately ends up being the purchase point. And so for that reason, mobile is the real conduit for all of these um, other points of influence. And so it's all too frequently that our, our conversations start to gravitate back towards where the opportunities are in mobile for our brands and, uh, and our, our clients and their brands. And so it's, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's difficult to summarize right, everything that's happening in the mobile space, but I think as it pertains to consumer purchase behaviors, this uh, dynamic is something we see that's, that's at play just about uh, across brands that are as big as Coca-Cola to uh, you know, smaller niche brands on a local level. George, George, did you work with on the consumer um, side of things with the sales? Can you give some examples? Because sure. you, you know you hear these you hear these big agency guys with these incredible flow charts, <laughs> and you're like, I absolutely got to do that. And then you go home to your office, and you have no idea what to do. Right? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it, 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 I think I've got a slide of some examples that, uh, of what we've done, but um, an, an interesting thing. So if you take a look at you know, the mobile landscape in general, I think you know, there's many opportunities to obviously market your brand or your company. And, and some of the basic elements are making sure that when you search for something, or when a consumer searches for something and you're relevant to that search, that it shows up. So if you don't have a Foursquare, if, you don't, if your business isn't on a Foursquare page, if it's not on a Yelp page, um, if it isn't in Google Maps, people aren't going to find you. So what we did, uh, we had a lot of demand for, for certain things. Um, one of them, we studied consumers. The demand for the consumer was, was hey, you know, being Nokia, we're obviously a large global company. There was a demand for consumers from Indonesia. They really wanted to use Foursquare, and they really liked the game, game mechanic behind it. But smartphones weren't prevalent in Indonesia. So what did we do? 
Nokia has Series 40 phones, which are feature phones. J2, they run on J2ME apps. We did an app with Foursquare in Indonesia. It's now their fourth or fifth biggest market around the world. And you know, the consumers are using that for discovering businesses, discovering what's going on around them, and they love the game mechanic. So much so that they think they're also cheating in the United States. I see a lot of Indonesian names cheating in the United States, but that's, that's neither here nor there. But you know, the good news is, hey, you've got people from Indonesia discovering your brands in North America. <laughs> um, but another thing, if you I'll kind of cut down, if you see um, augmented reality is one thing that we're also building into um, every single one of, uh, you know, Nokia was building into every single one of their maps applications. You know, you're, you're pulling real-time data from information that you simply provide about your company on the web. You hold up your camera phone and you can figure out where all the businesses are around you. I know Yelp's put that in their application too. It's, it's actually kind of a cool thing. I think it's called Monocle on Yelp. But it's, um, it's super cool. And you know, in essence, you are promoting your business there. Um, some of the other models that we looked at were, um, were, were you know, for CNN with their news wall. We, we actually uh, found out that CNN was wanting to target uh, consumers who like to, you know, essentially post video or news to YouTube. They were losing that market to YouTube. So in the application, we implemented a way where you start it, and it quickly starts the camera before the app starts. So you could actually get the, you know, the latest breaking news that you have. Um, and then automatically uploads it to CNN. So citizen journalism, whatever you want to call it, it's, it's, it's based on the consumer behavior that they saw that there was a gap on. They came to us and said, how are we going to implement this? And they impl we implemented it um, as an exclusive for, uh, for Nokia devices. OK. I think we have a couple, one, one is Starbucks, and we also have, uh, Gene, you've done some things. Let's see what's up here. Starbucks, that's Wyden Kennedy. Yeah, well, actually, no, Wyden and Kennedy should not uh, and cannot take credit for this. With the, we have worked with Starbucks. Um, this was actually done um, inside of Starbucks, but they deserve enormous credit, I believe, for cracking the code on something that I still think is um, a pretty open landscape and should be a space that's monitored for years to come, which is the mobile device really being the conduit for purchase um, and uh, and what Starbucks is able to do is um, they have a little bit of an advantage, naturally, in being able to have control over their own retail spaces. But I'm sure many of you have seen this and are familiar with it. Um, the penetration has been uh, phenomenal. And it's testament well, walk, walk to... Walk us through it here. Yeah, so effectively, um, what, what you have in the top left corner there is um, really just a mobile coupon redemption. Um, you can purchase the credit through PayPal or through your credit card or even a cash at a Starbucks. It's, it effectively just loads your card and um, that card is then living uh, on your device. And then, you know, I think some brands would think, okay, that's good enough, we can stop there. But I think what Starbucks did was they really considered, uh, you know, all of the surrounding elements, how to really apply that um, application in a way in which it became something more than just uh, a redemption model. And so you can see through some, some of the geolocating um, technology, uh, you know, it, it leveraged that so that people can have a broader awareness of where their closest Starbucks is, where they can actually you know, go and, um, and, and get their favorite drink. And then when it comes to your favorite drink, there's the, the opportunity to personalize that, right? So you don't go in and, and have to stand in line and then explain to the barista what you'd like. In fact, you know, all that information is shared in, in an agree with a degree of immediacy. But for Starbucks on the back end, that's tremendous you know, data for them to be able to collect and then know that individual is ordering these drinks. And then to uh, reinforce that relationship uh, through their loyalty program and the rewards program in a way in which there's a currency there that's also being built, it, it, it just starts to uh, extend the life of what this application is beyond just uh, a quicker way uh, for people to move through the lines or for you to have the convenience of credit on your mobile device if you may not have cash or, or a card with you. Um, and the other thing that I think is, is interesting about it is that you know you can personalize it so that um, if you so wish, and some people do, uh, you know you you can publicize or share at least with your friends where you are at that Starbucks if they want to come join you for a drink, what you're drinking, and all of a sudden it becomes uh, you know, a, another conversation piece that Starbucks is a part of. And, and there's these, these small elements that are, that are brand enhancers that, uh, you know, just make Starbucks 
from a relationship standpoint that much uh, richer. It's the ubiquity of Starbucks, I'm sure to some people, especially in a, in a, in a, in a, a coffee astute city like Portland, you know, can be irritating at times, but you cannot, um, you know, you cannot dismiss some of the smart things that they've done with this application in the mobile space in a way to really transform the Starbucks experience. Um, That's also, you're also talking about a huge, huge company. I mean, yeah. Gina, Airbar, I just call you Genie. Genie, <laughs> look at that. Um, it, it, I mean, you must have companies that come to you and say, hey, can you build me that Starbucks mm -hmm. app? Like, I go to an Alberta bakery all the time, and I'd love yeah. it. And if it had something like that, I would use it specifically yeah. for them, and I'd be proud to use it and proud to share it out. What yeah. do you do? Like, how hard is that to actually make? And what do you do when people come to you and say, we want that? Sure. Well, you, you don't know how spot on you are because somebody came to us this week and, and asked us that very same question. They oh, said, really? okay, we tore down the Starbucks app, and that's what we want. <laughs> I said, okay, how much money do you have? <laughs> in, all, in, all, in all seriousness, right. though, um, that there are, and actually there's a slide in here that, that, that kind of illustrates this pretty well. Um, there are a couple of different considerations when you're really thinking about trying to, um, here we go. So uh, one, of our, one of our oldest and, and dearest clients is the city of Cambridge, Massachusetts, or as the car talk guys say, Cambridge, meh. And they're, uh, they're great mm -hmm. friends of ours, but being a municipality of just over 100,000 people, they're not very well healed. I mean, they're obviously well healed people, but as a city, they don't have the kinds of piles of money that Starbucks has to build an app. So when they came to us, they have a, um, what, I think there's one of these called PDX Reporter. It's basically a, a citizen reporting app. And it's great because if you're out in the wilds of Portland or Cambridge and you see a pothole and you think, I'd really like to tell the city about that so they can come and fill it for me. Um, if you have a smartphone and you download their City of Cambridge iReport app, um, you can take a picture of it. It and then it takes your location via geolocation, tap a few details about it. Um, in fact, if you can read that from here, it's not just potholes, but graffiti, uh, missed recycling pickups. Um, I think we just added street lights. And my favorite, you can report a rodent. Um, if you happen to see a rodent out in, in Cambridge, if you're fast enough to take a picture of it, you get bonus points for that. Um, but in this case, to get to, to Kevin's question, what was a, a huge consideration for them was, well, we obviously want this to be available to both at least Android and iPhone users. And as far as we know, that means building two apps. And when you're a small city with a small budget and you want to build two dedicated native mobile apps for your citizens and you're told that that's you know, multiple six-figure engagement to get something like that built, it's really a non-starter unless you can come up with ways to cut costs. In this case, um, we were able to leverage PhoneGap, which is a, an open source platform that actually was acquired by Adobe a few months ago, maybe a little longer than a few months. Um, and now the open source version of it is still out there, um, but Adobe is running PhoneGap as a commercial product. But what it does is it essentially allows you to deploy mobile apps. Um, you, you write them once using HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and then package them for various platforms. So what we did with this is we built an app. We used a couple of uh, plug-in extensions to do things like access to the camera, which you can't get yet through HTML5. And then we were able, with one code base, to deploy it for both Android and iPhone. Uh, there are some experiential drawbacks to this. In this case, um, if you're an Android user, um, you'll notice their tabs are on the top. If you're an iPhone user, tabs for different sections of an app on the top would kind of confuse you. Um, for budget reasons, both versions look like the iPhone version, or the, this Android version. So there are trade-offs. You know, if we wanted to rebuild it slightly to work differently for iPhone and Android, um, we could if they wanted to spend more money on it. But as it stands, the, you know, the, the uptake has been great. It connects directly to the city system on the back end. and as far as we know, it's, uh, it's been a, a very big success and was, from a budget standpoint, reasonably easy to do. How much? Um, I don't actually know the total, the total cost off the top of my head, but definitely not multiple six figures. Not six sure. figures, yeah. okay. So, so an app gets built, and, and George, you mentioned this, and Gene W. mentioned this, is um, uh, search. So getting this app to be found. What are some concrete things that people should be thinking about if they're building an app? to make sure that it gets found. Like George, you mentioned to me when we were talking, when we met for coffee a month ago, you talked about the search explosion. Yeah, Mobile search explosion. I, I, do, I do think that um, search is, number one, there's, a, there's an inherent uh, issue or problem with search in that it's fragmented. So if you're gonna be searching, say on an Android device and you're looking for, I don't know, a donut, right? Voodoo donuts perhaps. Um, and you, you type it in, 
Um, if the, you don't know if there's a Voodoo Donuts app, you don't know if there's a Voodoo Donuts um, experience, what you're going to get on that device. You can just type it into Google, I think you're just going to get the website. Um, and I'm, I'm going to plug Microsoft and Bing here because they do a really good job at this. But they have something called App Connector. So what they do is when, when they tell you to build an application, the, you have to put in this little extra bit of code. But what it does is it enables, when you search around on, an, on a Windows phone device, you, get, you get, just type in donuts. And what it'll do is it'll search the App Store, it'll search Maps, it'll search a bunch of different places, Zune, you know, the Marketplace, and the web, and it'll give you an aggregated list of a bunch of content that has Voodoo Donuts in the list. It could be an app, it could be anything. So I think it's kind of a cool way to discover applications. And, and you've seen Apple, they, they acquired Chomp, I think, to do something similar because, you know, 600,000 apps, and, and is, it's just hard. You know, you, you get in there, if you don't get the spot up top, you're done, right? Um, so these boom-bust cycles in, in search and app stores, I think we need to solve that problem. I think Microsoft took a big step forward in doing so with App Connector. I think one of you entrepreneurs in the room should figure out a good way to do it on other platforms, especially Android. <laughs> now, you, you only really have to look at how coveted a position the featured app or featured game of the week is in the iPhone App Store to see how broken it is as a search platform. I mean, their, their key business is not search. Their key business is selling apps. So they're much more of a publisher in the sense of they want to keep stock fresh and rotate it and sell lots of apps to lots of customers. They're not necessarily as concerned with findability of the specific thing that you're looking for. And I think we're going to see that change over the years as the, the App Store matures. But for now, because they don't have to be a search, mm -hmm. a search utility, I think they're, they're really not. So, so how is that change going to affect brands? You know, I'm curious on big brands and small brands, of, um, and this is open for anyone here, how is this mobile marketing shaping the evolution of brands? And I'd love to hear this answer from a large brand perspective, from someone in a small brand perspective. Yeah, I think um, in, in terms of large brands, it, you know, it's interesting because brands are, want to have near ubiquity across multiple platforms. They want to be in, you know, they want to be in Yelp. They want to be on Foursquare. They want to be in Google Maps. They want to be on Facebook. But just throwing something up on Facebook and say, that's my marketing budget. It's done. <laughs> it's not a good thing. You really do need to optimize and have people you know, interacting on Twitter, interacting on, on, um, on Facebook, and, and all of the various outputs. And you need a kind of a, a social media person in terms of uh, you know, making sure that your marketing and your outreach is happening, making sure that everything stays updated, making sure you're responding to any issues. Uh, I'm a Foursquare administrator for Portland. There's so many people that just create these, this nonsense, and I have to go in and delete it all the time. Um, but it's, you know, I, think, I think as far as big brands go, you, you know, you're certainly, a lot of the ones that I've worked with, their, their biggest concern is certainly is, you know, if, if I'm going to work with you, um, can I get guaranteed a spot or can I get guaranteed three, four you know, days or, or weeks or whatever it is of, of being at the top of the app store? And, and what we try to tell them is, you know, that, okay, on the, on the Windows platform, it's a little different as long as you, you do all these metadata and meta tags um, and someone searches for anything that's closely relevant to your brand, it's going to show up. So, you know, building a phone around search or building, you know, a device or building an experience around search I think is is one step in the direction where, you know, large brands and small brands could have a, a you know a good fighting chance. At, uh, mm -hmm. you know, well, okay, so what about small brands? Well, you've made, you've made a great point about a fighting chance. I think mobile, for one thing, because it's, it sort of levels the playing field for consumers. It gives small brands a fighting chance. And a great example of this is in the way that location-based search works now, in a in a market like Portland, where we're more geographically dense with small businesses in relation to big businesses, for example, if you're in downtown Portland and you're searching for just a coffee shop, you are much more likely to come up with one in your immediate physical vicinity mm -hmm. that's a mom and pop than you are to come up with a, a large chain store. And that may differ based on different markets, but you see a sort of democratization of search, search results by virtue of the fact that they're naturally more location relevant to you, which mm -hmm. means by extension, they become more culturally relevant. So it's not necessarily the advertiser or marketer that can afford the biggest billboard or the most TV advertising anymore that wins. It's the one that could be the most locally, culturally, and immediately personally relevant yeah. to whoever's doing the search. But, but if you have millions of dollars, it helps. Sure, if you like, want to try to squash those local it, businesses. Yeah, I mean, you worked on the... You, yeah. <laughs> Let's start, back yeah, to Starbucks. You have millions yeah. of dollars, that's the name of marketing. I mean, you worked on the, um, the Coca-Cola... Uh, Super Bowl. Super Bowl, polar. I don't know if anyone saw, uh, watched Super Bowl, the, the polar bears that were animated in real time 
and one was for one team, one was for the other team. Only my wife knows actually who played in the Super Bowl. I don't, so I can't name these teams. <laughs> but they would actually like get up and clap and applaud, and they'd fall asleep during like the competitors' commercials. And um, maybe if you can just talk a little about this, Gene, like what what does that mean for specifically Coca-Cola uh, because of the mobile aspect of that? Yeah, well, I think it's testament to the fact that um, Coca-Cola's ambition this year was to be able to bring back their iconic polar bears on what is you know, effectively the biggest stage for them, certainly the most expensive. It's kind of their state of the union is the Super Bowl. Um, but to just bring them back in a 60-second ad um, wasn't enough, and um, that was at our encouragement as well. The, the fact of the matter is, is the way in which people view the Super Bowl and many other TV programs is with another screen, and it's the second screen dynamic that is uh, you know, pretty prominent now. and. Um, you know, whether or not that's a laptop or a mobile device, um, it, it's, it's skewing more towards it being a mobile device, especially for live events, things like um, American Idol um, or other sporting events where people want to be in uh, you know, social exchange with their, their network for what they're experiencing and sharing that. And so it provides another channel for brands to um, not provide competing content. I mean, we weren't trying to serve up um, sort of these real-time response of these polar bears watching the same game in the Arctic to people to override their primary point of engagement, which was watching the, the game and the ads, but to provide something additive, to provide something that would enhance it. And I think that, you know, this is, we are now in a uh, multi-screen generation. And, you know, the mobile device was always kind of viewed as the third screen. Um, so you'd have your, your TV as sort of your primary hub for the family and uh, in, inside of a home, and then you'd have your, um, your computer be it desktop or laptop. And the fact is, is that, that, that mobile is, is now working its way um, to be the primary screen. And it, you know, for, for all of the advantages that it has over sort of the stationary um, you know, television or, um, you know, e even, uh, you know, what your laptop or desktop is. I mean, the, the lines are blurred there, right? So um, between, you know, mobile devices and tablets, I mean, there was, I think it was in maybe even late 2010. I know in two th by 2011, they were, you know, mobile devices were outselling uh, PCs. And I just think that that's testament to that fact and that sort of behavior um, is permeating the way in which big brands are, are marketing, certainly, and having to think about, you know, stages like the Super Bowl. How is it that, you know, all that money we just spent on a TV ad isn't enough anymore? Um, but I, th I think your point about uh, for some much smaller brands on a local level, it's an incredibly exciting time because you have the, the opportunity, especially through, ge through geolocating technology, to be able to provide, you know, the right content at the right place at the right time. And that's something that um, can be a very intimate sort of exchange of, of inform information, really valuable, that I think, um, you know, uh, uh, local consumers may be a little bit more reluctant to from bigger brands. So I think small brands, uh, you know, have, have tremendous opportunity uh, in this space as well. Yeah, and just as a, a personal plug of Crowd Compass, just because we went through a, a website revamp recently, one thing I think is interesting to think about with these mobile devices, especially for, for small companies, is why would someone check your website on a mobile phone? Like, do they really want all the information, or they just want to call you? Or do they just want to contact you? You know, and, and so we had our usability guys help us out on this, and if you do check out crowdcompass.com on your mobile phone, it's just a really simple, here's our super basic information, and contact us which is a completely different experience from the actual website. And we're having a lot of results of who is actually contacting us and co comparing. You know, a lot of companies are now starting to compare what's my mobile traffic versus what's my website traffic, and that's helping them make decisions. Um, last week, I didn't uh, open up for questions uh, early enough, and I got some hate mail from the people who were <laughs> live streaming. So I'm going to open up a little bit earlier. I have a ton more questions I could ask. But let me open up just some questions from the audience here for our panelists, um, either on live stream or in person. Does anyone have any burning mobile marketing madness questions? 
Well, let me grab the mic. Well, just have you say uh, your name and, um, and your company. <laughs> and the mic won't be loud. It's just for the live stream people. Hi, um, Karen Simon. I'm with AHA Consulting. We do websites for city governments and local government okay. municipalities. So um, we've got some business going in Massachusetts. I'm just curious, um, did you also work on the web solution for the similar type of app? And so that? the city, we, did, we do work on the city's various web properties. Um, we've actually recently just about finished consolidating them all into one content management system, which is a topic for a totally different day. <laughs> I don't think anybody wants to talk about CMSs tonight. Unless you do, which is fine. <laughs> Um, Beer is downstairs yeah. with, with alcohol. <laughs> uh, but yeah, in all seriousness, they already had a, uh, a web-based tool. And when you think about things in terms of the mobile context, one of the things that's a little less useful in uh, sort of desktop or laptop web is a location-based reporting of uh, something that's going wrong in a city. It's a lot more useful to be able to do that on the scene. So they weren't getting that much in the way of, of use of that via the, the website, and it's actually shot up since it's been put on mobile. Yeah. So unfortunately, Portland hasn't implemented anything like that yet, because there's still a lot of potholes out there. Yeah. <laughs> we will. Um, question, you're the mic man. Okay, we have a question over here. Just say your name and company, please. Yes, my name is Paul Enriquez, and I'm uh, with Monster Worldwide. Um, I'm kind of curious about the Cambridge, Massachusetts app myself. You know, you see a lot of companies and a lot of entities building apps in kind of in a bubble. Mm -hmm. Their app doesn't go beyond what they only designed it for. Somebody like a Cambridge Mass, do they ever think about actually getting the IP on that and selling that to other municipalities to actually make some money for the cities? It's not a bad idea. Um, there, there actually are a few examples of cities that have done things like that. Um, you look at some of the websites. We actually did a, a fairly thoroughgoing, oh, sorry. It's, Push it a little bit away. There we go. Is that better? Okay. Yeah. So we did a fairly thoroughgoing uh, consulting engagement with, with them, looking at what other municipalities were doing with mobile web specifically and with mobile apps. And what we found is that there are a handful of platforms out there, some of which were pioneered by um, other cities, specifically for rolling out mobile versions of city websites. I think Arlington, Texas, oddly enough, has, has one of the, the more prominent ones. Um, so it is, it's, it's not a new idea. It's definitely something that's been done. Uh, from their perspective, I think uh, they're really looking at it, for better or worse, in a bubble, because they're looking at the responsibility being to their constituencies. If you get into smaller companies, they may, I think, be more enterprising. But, but cities tend to be fairly focused on, on serving the electorate and, and responding to mandates and you know, responsible stewardship of things like taxpayer funds. Uh, it's a little easier on taxpayers if you turn that hundred thousand dollars into a million dollars revenue. Definitely <laughs> true. Definitely <laughs> true. Advertising revenue. Um, okay, one question in the front, and then we're going to go to a live stream question. We're going to just ignore Spencer all night long. He he won the chocolate bunny here. <laughs> uh, take a bite. Uh, I'm Mike Wills. I'm an independent uh, website, internet marketing consultant. Um, I'm wondering about. Um, iPads and other tablet devices, and to what degree those are mobile in the same way your phone is mobile versus more home or office based. Yeah. And um, are we going to have to create three different things for those three different Probably, screens? Probably, yes. Yeah. Yeah, the Unfortunately, there's fragmentation. It, it just, it, it's, um, it's a bound. And I think you'll even see Samsung, how they came out with a Note, which is something in between a tablet and a mobile device. So you know, they're creating you know, uh, more fragmentation, I think. And of course, Android's fragmented enough. So you've got screen sizes. You've got three different versions of Android that are out there in the marketplace. Yeah, unfortunately, maybe the, the path of least resistance is HTML5, which you probably know a lot about. Yeah, a, a fair amount. I mean, the, the good news is, it, I, I like to think of that, that Samsung device as sort of the second breakfast of, of mobile devices. They finally invented the one, one that's in between brunch and lunch. Um, the, the, the fact that we have that many different screen sizes and form factors, what it really speaks to is that everything's on a continuum. Um, and there, it's not just screen sizes that really affect what's mobile and what's not. The, the biggest driver from my perspective is actually touch. Um, because the, with the, the minor outlier of touchscreen kiosks that you still have out there, um, most touch-based devices are, for the time being, relatively mobile. A study a couple of years ago, maybe a year ago, on, on tablet usage, the results were pretty interesting. It actually showed that tablets were, quote-unquote, mobile 
but only within the home. What was happening is that people were choosing, rather than going and getting their laptop or going and sitting down at their desk, they'd just carry a tablet around with them. But they tended not to leave the house as much. I think as you see, more of them get um, uh, coverage with some form of non-Wi-Fi, either it's LTE or 3G or whatever, or 4G. Uh, as you see more and more of that, you may see them become more mobile outside of the home, but um, they're, they really did. I mean, when Apple introduced the iPad, they, they, they invented a new category of device. And what the market's done is now sort of caught up and defined everything let's, along that let's spectrum. Also, let's also not forget that Microsoft with Windows 8 is going to come out with this whole new line of ARM processor-based right. low-power tablets, which are, which are, in essence, full-blown Windows on, on a device. So you know, you're going to have your full browser on there and everything, and it's going to be in a tablet form factor. So you know, again, you know, what are, you, are we talking about another app for that? Uh, they've got the Metro UI, which is across now all of their phones with Xbox and with, uh, with Windows 8. So are, are you going to have to design yet something else, an app on a Microsoft device, a Microsoft tablet too, if you want to hit those oh, 600 million or so people out there that have Windows 7 licenses? So It makes responsive mobile web definitely mm -hmm. a very attractive choice for developers and marketers. So I do want to go to live, a live stream question, but I just got a text message from Dave Shanley, who's in the back of the room, and Dave's my new boss at Crowd Compass, <laughs> so I have to interrupt everything for this question. So a question from Dave Shanley uh, is, uh, how to drive marketing, how to, how to drive decisions making uh, around mobile early, uh, mobile purchases early in the process? Like what metrics do you use to make decisions of if you're going to go the mobile route or not? Do well, the clients can, just say everyone's yeah, doing can, it, so I'm going to do it, or how do you do that? That's a really good question. Yeah, for, that's why he's the founder. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for us, from a practice group perspective, we're broken down into five groups, and I won't bore you with telling you what all of them are, but the first is digital strategy, and the last on the train is analytics and optimization. So what analytics and optimization, typically the role it's played is, okay, you rolled out this website, you put Google Analytics in it, and now we're going to watch it, and we're going we're gonna to see what it does, and we're going to optimize and fix it as you go. And, and everything we got wrong when we guessed how we were going to build it, we're going to get right over time. What we do now, um, we like to look at those analytics and research up front and say, okay, well, for one thing, let's look at how many devices that are not really well served by your site are coming here looking at one page, spending five seconds on it, and then leaving. And that gives us a really good perspective on what, under, what the underserved market is. Um, from there, really pulling away from the technology and thinking about what the, the actual customer experience that you're trying to provide is. Um, in my, from my perspective, native apps are a lot better for, at doing sort of one thing really well. And if, you're, if you start down the path of building a native mobile app, and what you end up with is something that looks like sort of a framed website from 1999 that has every single piece of content about your company, you've probably gone off the rails at some point. And, mm -hmm. and looking back at exactly what you were trying to do and what that single kind of single purpose for that app. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd sort of, agree. I think yeah. uh, some of the assessment that some of uh, the brands that we work with uh, apply to that question is based on, well, what are you trying to achieve? And um, really, how big is that audience uh, for that objective? Because too frequently, I think that um, if you want to cast that, the, the, the net so wide that, you, that you're wanting uh, that, that mobile application to be able to do a multitude of things, um, it might be at the expense of being able to do one thing particularly well. Um, you know, I mentioned the, the the loyalty aspect to Starbucks, you know, um, and kind of reading a little bit of a backstory, uh, they're, th they're thinking that's what they wanted to get to. They wanted people to be able to carry around almost a badge that I am a Starbucks, you know, enthusiast. I, I love dr drinking Starbucks beverages and going to Starbucks. And um, to, to see how they at least had a place to start uh, and then what they were able to build from there, I think is a, at least a, a smart way to go about it versus saying, okay, here's all the things we want it to be able to do. Um, and versus, like, let's look at the analytics and actually looking at it from, let's look at it from a brand perspective. Yeah. Of, like, this is our goal. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't um, separate the analytics from it. I think you need to be able to set up some metrics for being able to gauge, um, you know, quantifiably how, uh, you know, you know, how successful or the degree of interaction that uh, you're having, the amount of traffic and, and, and user exchange that you're actually gathering. Uh, but I, I don't think they should, they should be uh, mutually exclusive. 
Okay. And in Starbucks' case, that was what, $26 million worth of revenue through their mobile app? $26 million? In 2011. Huh. Okay. That's remarkable. Now, if you, yeah, I mean, think eBay is another good example where um, I think their metric was they did about $4 billion in trans, $4 billion in transactions. Now, it's funny math, but $4 billion in transactions that, that either originated or completed on a mobile device. So, you know, it's amazing. The experience on an eBay, uh, you know, the eBay app on a tablet, it's, it, you know, it just does a few things really well. And it's, you know, getting bidding, um, you know, searching bidding and, and completing the transaction. And I think... Um, you know, eBay is gonna is gonna go out in a big way with with PayPal PayPal here as well. You know, mm -hmm. keep it keeping it simple and having it do the one thing that you want it to do that allows you to generate the most amount of you know, either revenue or clicks or whatever it is that you're you know metrics whatever it is that you're you're trying to measure. Um, you know, Trulia did it as well. There, Trulia took a long time to get their app right, but when they figured it out, people just want to use their mobile device to figure out what for sale in the neighborhood. That's it. That's all it does, and it does it well. It doesn't need to be the full website. Right. Okay, live stream question. This better be a good question. Live streamers, we're going to turn off the camera. <laughs> this, uh, this question here is uh, from the Southeast Woodstock group. Uh, apparently, they have a uh, big Google TV on a flat panel uh, watching oh, all this. Right. Uh, all right, all right. We'll keep it on. Oh. <laughs> so their, their question is, uh, how is healthcare in embracing mobile from the uh, doctor-patient uh, uh, perspective? Mm, that is a good question. Healthcare and mobile. Uh, well, I, I can't speak too much on healthcare and mobile. I do have a, a colleague of mine who went... And, and into that space because he did see a big gap there. I mean, it's uh, when you think about the healthcare vertical, there's certainly a lot of opportunity. I think if you're if you're working on it now, you you probably noticed that. I don't think hospitals and doctors are getting it just yet. I don't think they're doing it right. I think it's going to take someone to come in there, go to a Dell, go to someone that that sells their products into the healthcare vertical and specialize that vertical for them. You know, come there with a content strategy. When you think about Windows 8 and tablets that are going to be coming out. And someone like Adele, who needs to, who, who needs to uh, well, at this point, they're going to have an app store. Dell's probably going to have something that's branded Dell or whatever it is they want to brand it on a Windows 8 machine. But Dell sells into the medical vertical, so they can have an opportunity there to go build out an entire app suite for, for doctors in the medical vertical just doing that. So lots of opportunity. That's one thing that kind of came across my plate recently was you know, OEMs trying to figure out a way differentiate themselves when Windows 8 comes out using healthcare applications. I was just amazed when my doctor emailed me back on, on some, you know, health yeah. portal a year ago. I feel like healthcare is like way it's catching still up behind. Yeah. Yeah, they're starting to catch up with things like community community technology, web web communities and things like that. Where I think the real opportunity is if you look at what um, we we do have a number of clients in the health healthcare space, um, ODS, health plans, um, OHSU, um, a number of others, and the, the, w what we've seen is that if you if you look at the sort of app space for doctors in particular, there's there are a lot of there are a lot of examples of one or two categories of apps that are again they're very single serving. They're things like I want to look at radiology films, or I want to take some patient notes, um, which basically makes it sort of a glorified Evernote. Uh, there are, there are a lot of apps that are sort of like that. There are very few really good applications of. The, the sort of full customer experience of the patient out there. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really frustrating as a healthcare consumer to look at where healthcare is in this, in this country and how it's, it's adopted technology that, that works really well for insurance companies in terms of keeping track of every little thing that they're going to bill you for, but it doesn't necessarily work particularly well for the end customer, which mm -hmm. is, I think, ultimately the patient, and that may have something to do with third-party payment. There may be a lot of other sort of economic privacy philosophical concerns. reasons for it. Privacy, privacy concerns, it's got to be big. Ultimately, yeah. I think that dam's going to break, and the, the customer experience revolution will come to healthcare. It's just it's going to take time, and we've got to get through the whole, you know, all the healthcare reform before yeah, we can actually you, get to Yeah, you treaded like really carefully on yeah. that last comment. <laughs> That's fair enough. Okay, so... Uh, one more question from live stream and one more from the audience, and then we're going to get future predictions here uh, from our expert mobile panelists to wrap things up. Paul, live stream. Uh, yeah, they would uh, like to know about your thoughts on the future of mobile banking. Do we have anyone from Simple in the audience? <laughs> we'll Simple banking here. <laughs> nope. No, no, at least no one that wants to comment. Well, I mean, I think that's, you know, Simple, they came here, they came to Portland, they set up shop, and they're trying to change the future of mobile banking, and I don't work for them, so I can't speak on it, but 
I think you know one of the cool things um, when you think about where banks can take it. Uh, think about what Janrain does. Think about Bank of America. They have this big database of logins and passwords. They can take that social if they want to. You know, they could figure out ways to make things, you know, make banking seem a little bit cooler than it really is. Uh, <laughs> you know, gamification. <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah, but you know, and then again, PayPal is is trying to go after Square. I think you'll see at least maybe not banking, but in the mobile payment space. It's, it's going to blow up. I think PayPal here is, is a massive. It's not the, just the margins, though. I think it's only about 0.05% cheaper to use uh, PayPal here than Square. But I think it's the fact that, the, you know, the geofencing, being able to walk into a store, have your device recognize this, and just you can conduct a purchase without ever um, even going to the register. It's, you know, I know, I know they have it in, uh, in, in, uh, in Apple stores, but, you know, you have to go and swipe your card. Here, it's just going to register a device, boom, you want to click something, buy, it's done. You, don't, you can just take it, put it in your own bag, and walk out with the, with the, with the shirt or whatever the, whatever the thing is. Um, but, yeah, I think it's mobile payments more than mobile banking, and I'd really love to see what Square is up to, because I think we've all been waiting. Uh, yeah. Sorry, what uh, Simple, Simple is up yeah. to, because we've all been waiting to see. Mm -hmm. Any uh, one last question from the audience? Spencer. <laughs> name, name and company. Oh. Spencer Crandall, I'm a consultant. And um, I am wondering, you've done a great job talking about uh, your branding and uh, geolocating a lot of information about that. But what about advertising? Um, that is you know, a fraction, a part of the marketing budget. And is it effect, mobile advertising effective? And um, what, what can small and big businesses do to be more effective with that? It well, doubled in spending from 300 million to 700 million in 2011. Well, and Facebook's gonna be putting ads on mobile devices now, so, you know, they've got a vested interest in it. Yeah, I, and I think that um, there's a lot of indicators that suggest that, uh, we're on the early part of that curve, so there is a there's at least uh, a, enough excitement around sort of the immaturity of the space and being able to, uh, you know, really explore ways in which to leverage mobile advertising and which you know users have not have not seen it. And by default of that, the expectation is that there will be greater levels of engagement, um, but there's also you know, some concern about the, the degree to which there's the, the allowance in mobile for there to be a real value add. I mean, it's no, no one's really abiding or, or smart brands are not trying to follow the old model, although it probably doesn't feel like it uh, because we're all inundated by ads. But that the old model of sort of the push messaging is uh, deteriorating. And I think that in, in the mobile space, the way in which mobile advertising dollars that you reference will be spent won't necessarily be on a, you know, in a, in a, uh, a, a mobile unit, um, but in the investment within mobile and the way in which there's a crossroads between mobile and, and social activity. And being able to, you know, really permeate that space um, is where I think the majority of the mobile spending uh, from a lot of a, a lot of advertisers will uh, will be applied versus what I think happened you know what we saw in the the late 90s and um, in, in early 2000 was just this wash of sort of uh, uh, of, of banner ads uh, online that just um, you know really didn't um, turn the, the sort of effectiveness rates that a lot of people were were hoping for so um, I do think there's, there's some learnings that people are taking from that as we go into the mobile space and, and some real considerations in which it's going to be a greater value add for the viewer or user. Or a greater annoyance because it's going to chase you around. Like that <laughs> yeah. banner ad, you won't be able to shake it off. I don't know. I think, I think if you believe some of the stats, the, what we're looking at really is lower volume and higher value per ad in that you're much more likely to reach somebody if you're properly targeting that is actually mm -hmm. going to have an interest mm -hmm. in the ad you're showing mm -hmm. them. And that's something that, you know, advertising has been sort of chasing that for years. Yeah. And a great anecdote, one of the, the, the I think personalization is going gonna, is gonna to carry things forward in a much more meaningful way. And I think we've really only sort of scratched the surface with it. Great anecdote of this. I had a colleague who watches a lot of Hulu and she came in the other day and said, 
I finally got to click yes on is this ad relevant to you? Because it was an ad for Maker's Mark. And I stood up and I said, yeah, 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 yes, yes. That's relevant to me. Send me more of that. And I think when you have consumers that are actually eager to be advertised yeah. to for the things that they're actually interested in, uh, you have a different market. Mm. Okay, future predictions. So we're putting together a compilation of uh, predictions at, yeah. of all the panelists at the end of this year to see who was right and who was wrong <laughs> and broadcasting it out via mobile devices. So <laughs> gamification, yes. We'll have the knockdown of the different panelists and the buildup. So mobile marketing predictions. Uh, what is going to be the biggest innovation in mobile marketing when, when we look back at 2012? Well, um, I think it's I think it's gonna, I'm gonna stay with search. I'm, I'm feeling good about search. I, um, I do think that search will get better, and I think relevant search. And I, you know, I maybe start to cross over into maybe some of your answers, but that's okay. Um, locally relevant ads, locally relevant search um, is going to be huge. And you've already seen it with you know Foursquare implementing radar. It already buzzes you, lets you know when you're near a place you want to check into again. You know, that's kind of a space where, you know, they can start targeting ads to people or people uh, or, or business owners can start using Foursquare Radar to, to, you know, push relevant advertising or relevant information to that consumer. So search geolocation in a big way, I think, in, 20, in 2012. And, and your first and last name <laughs> is? George Kurtick. Okay. <laughs> okay. Next prediction. Yeah, I'm. I'm gonna go with mobile payments. I think. I think we're at a point where um, we've we've had this sort of bubbling under the surface for a while, and people are just now starting to actually get comfortable with the idea of, of paying with things via a mobile device. Um, and I think it, it'll be a dogfight to see which platform actually gets more, most broadly adopted. But I, I really think that when we look back at 2012, we're gonna look back at it as the year when when more when a, a critical mass of people really started paying for things with their phones and just feel, figuring it was a natural thing to do. First and last name? Gene Airbar. Put a stamp on it, okay? Um, I would agree with the other Gene if this were 2013. But I think, it's, I think that's a tough ask out of 2012, but just because I think the, um, the, the mobile payment model has, there's a few aspects to it, particularly at the merchant level, that are going to be a difficult thing to uh, realize in this year. Um, you know, there's specific dev devices and through some NFC technology, I think that it proves promising. It'll, it'll happen and it'll absolutely happen. I just think it's, um, it's a little bit more cumbersome um, than, than all of us might like because it's going to be an enormous convenience. Um, Are you dodging the question? No, no. I, 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 I it's will, not what is it not going to be. It's what is it going to be. No, he's just more patient. No, because I was, I was debating Mobile that. Mobile phones will not. No, because I think it's, there's, there's a lot, of, a lot of truth to that. Um, I think that um, sound recognition and sharing is going to be, I think we're on the cusp of something really remarkable here. When you, you know, there's smaller applications that you see with like um, uh, Shazam or um, Soundwave and some of these that have uh, been able to, and, and even, um, you know, um, the, the more recent um, iPhone, I'm blanking on the, uh, Surrey, um, you know, that is, I think, a, a real uh, aspect that brings some humanity back into uh, what has been a lot of rich technology. And um, by voice, there's an immediacy to it that I think just provides a lot of power behind that. Uh, th th that that's a real engine for, I think, some pretty transformative things to happen. And, um, and for you know, sound recognition to be a way of, of creating and sharing, um, I think that by year's end, we'll see some things that, that we, that'll be pretty unexpected and I'll have a long lifespan to them. So I'm pretty excited to see what's happening in that space. Put your stamp on that with your Gene first. Gene Willis. Gene Willis, okay. Uh, everyone, round of applause for the panelists. Thank you. So just a couple quick announcements. Uh, next month, we're actually, we're usually the first Thursday of the month, we have some very special guests. We're bumping it one week, so it's gonna be on May 10th, and it's gonna be Video Killed the Radio Star. Uh, sign up early. And in June, we're going to be um, having the topic community management versus clever spam. Um, one more uh, round of applause is for Paul Collette, our filming uh, live streaming superstar. <laughs> 
It's making the sound better and better uh, every month, and uh, you can always watch this uh, live from home. Everyone, uh, if anyone can think of innovative ways to help clean up the room quickly, that would be great, and we're going to catch a beer downstairs here. Thank you.